Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone, from wherever in the world you may be joining us today. My name is Francesco Del Carpio, and I am the CFL York Operations Coordinator. I would like to officially open the seventh session of our AI for Global Health Challenges and Lessons Learned Speaker Series with a land acknowledgement. We acknowledge and recognize that many Indigenous nations have longstanding relationships with the territory upon which our campuses are located that precede the establishment of York University. The area is known as Tecoronto and has been caretaken by the Anishinaabek Nation, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, and the Huron Wendat. It is now home to many First Nation, Inuit, and Metis communities. We acknowledge the current treaty holders, the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. The territory is subject to the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant, an agreement to peaceably share and care for the Great Lakes region. As this is an online event, our participants may be joining from various locations, so I strongly encourage you to learn about the traditional land upon which you are located. With this, I welcome our moderator, our speaker, and our participants from around the world. Welcome to our webinar. Without further ado, it is my great pleasure to introduce our moderator, Dr. Blessing Ogbuokiri. Dr. Blessing Ogbuokiri is a postdoctoral fellow and instructor at York University, Canada. He has over 15 years of combined professional experience across a broad range of fields in academia, industry, and community-based organizations. He is a dynamic team player who is eager to utilize his diverse talents to advance in research and innovation. Dr. Ogbuokiri is interested in machine learning for health, data science for social good, social media computing, natural language processing, and theoretical computing. His goal is to actively collaborate with researchers in several interdisciplinary groups in using AI to help government and local communities to contain and manage the spread of community-based infectious disease outbreaks, such as COVID-19, malaria, and MPOX. Dr. Ogbuokiri, thank you very much for moderating today's session, and the floor is yours. All right, thank you very much, uh, Francesco, and welcome our uh... Uh, participants, wherever you're joining, I will go ahead to introduce uh, Dr. Moore. Uh, before I do that, I would first of all, you know, bring up the, the rules of the house for today. Uh, when Dr. Moore starts to present his uh, research, I would uh, encourage us, if you have any question, you can put it on the question and answer uh, tab. And also, if you want to speak, you can raise your hand. We'll ask you when to, we'll tell you when to speak. So I'll go ahead and introduce Dr. Moore. Dr. Stephen Moore is a senior lecturer at the Department of Mathematics, University of Cape, Town, Cape Coast, Ghana. He is a computational scientist who graduated from the Technical University of Kaisers Lothen, Germany, and Johannes Kepler University in Australia. He has, he has huge uh, interest in mathematics of data science. He has worked at the Australian Academy of Science Proxies Optima Engineering, Australia Engineering Software there, ESS, Australia, oh sorry, Austra and Rat Exploratory and Productive Processing uh, Ghana NLP. The, sorry, sorry, I, I repeat that. Austra Rag Exploration and Production in Vienna, Austria. Science, since, since relocating to Ghana in 2018, he co-founded uh, he's the co-founder of Ghana Natural Language Processing, Ghana NLP. He is the university's coordinator at the International Research Center for Artificial Intelligence under the auspices of UNESCO. He was part of the team that wrote the Ghana Artificial Intelligence Policy Framework and also a member of the team that designed the National High Performance Computing Center in Ghana. He has worked, or he has won several grants and, and awards from the European Union, the World Academy of Science, TWAS, Google Incorporated, the Regional Universities Forum for Capacity Building in Agriculture Forum, and Best Evolving College Research at the University of Cape Coast, Ghana. He has served under several common committees in Ghana, Africa, and globally. He supervises graduate students in Rwanda, Kenya, Burkina Faso, uh, Senegal, Cameroon, Ghana, and the United States of America. And also a serious, a serial mentor for the youth. He has written several scientific articles in several areas from mathematics, artificial intelligence, agriculture, health, and considers himself as a scientist with interest in research that makes impact to society. But we may welcome uh, Dr. Stephen Moore. Dr. Stephen Moore, the floor is yours. Thank you, 
Thank you very much. Um, should I share my screen already? Yes, can go ahead. Okay. Okay, so thank you for the invitation and thank you for letting me be part of the AI for global health challenges. Uh, so this is uh, something we started working on last year and I feel that it's, it's, uh, it's important and I wanted to share the information. Of course, also as part of our, as a research that we are developing here. So um, basically, uh, we started uh, when I moved, when I relocated to Ghana um, in 2018, started doing some research work around the areas of epidemiology. Um, we wrote uh, some articles on COVID and even fractional models as well in COVID. And currently, the one that we are developing on is on this idea that I'm presenting today which is on the data-driven uh, methods uh, that I intend to uh, present now. And this work I'm doing together with other colleagues of mine uh, in Ghana, uh, actually. So we, we all know about COVID. Uh, it started in 2019, um, somewhere in, Dece in December in China, uh, became a global pandemic issue in the first quarter of 2020. Then um, it started spreading all over. Our symptoms are really now very uh, folklore. If you if you have certain symptoms, you can easily test, tell you are COVID or positive or negative, and stuff like that. In Ghana, we recorded the first case on the 12th of March in 2020, and then subsequently it started growing. Uh, cases started developing. Uh, leading to not so much amount of deaths as compared to some other uh, countries, but quite significant as well. A lot of infected people. Uh, and because it's a low resource uh, in, in, in our parts of the world, when such pandemics or when such endemics occur, occur it's important to understand um, the dynamics of how they spread and how they go about in so many aspects of it. But uh, so it started with um, COVID-19 in Ghana, as I, as I stated earlier on, and then cases kept, keeps growing and growing. So this data is actually up to 2022, um, somewhere September that we took this data, the number of COVID-19 cases, and then as well as uh, the number of um, vaccination cases, vaccinated individuals, we started recording the numbers, and how many people have been vaccinated and so on. So the idea really was to study um, these situations. And when, when COVID came, uh, when the COVID whole model started, the idea started, started as um, you, get the, you get COVID, you get infected, you are asymptomatic, or asymptomatic means you are carrier of the disease. Uh, and then uh, symptomatic means uh, you are carrier of the disease, not showing symptoms. And then symptomatic means you are carrier of the disease, showing the symptoms. And then once you are you show symptoms or you have signs of this COVID, you are hospitalized. Uh, then you you recover. And then once you recover, um, of course you become susceptible again. So this was the the, the idea of some of these models. And then when vaccination started, so here you can see the vaccination class. When vaccination started, uh, immediately, um, initially we were told that, okay, once you get vaccinated, uh, you are totally uh, immune. Then after some time, we were told that, okay, you needed a second, a second shot if you took the AstraZeneca one. Or if you you just you didn't need any shot if you any second shot if you took the Johnson one, so then there became so many vaccinations uh, around us. Uh, so 
uh, we started learning, the, we started developing these models, also thinking of this dynamics as well. So in this model, we see a single vaccination model, which means um, once you are in, uh, vaccinated, it is okay. And with this, usually once you have these models, uh, such a model, uh, what you do is that you do uh, mathematical analysis, qualitative analysis of it. Uh, and that means that you have a, a COVID-19 vaccination model and you have a COVID-19 vaccination model where you have certain parameters uh, that's uh, explained that transmission rates. If you go back, you see, um, if we go back, we see that these parameters, transmission rates, uh, and then recruitment rates, uh, proportions of uh, reduction in transmission and so on. So these are really important parameters uh, in this kind of models. So usually once you, you have your model, you then try to find um, certain properties of the model. One of them, or the most critical one being the basic reproduction number. So once you have the basic reproduction number, you're able to tell the transmission of the, of the disease from one person to the other, how many people will get the disease for every one individual. Uh, so you, once you have uh, this idea of the basic reproduction number, you can use this to tell uh, some other properties or qualitatively, which is the local stability analysis, global stability analysis, uh, you talk about the sensitivity of these parameters in your model and how they affect um, how they affect the transmission dynamics, the transmission of uh, of the disease or of or your vaccination as well. The efficacy of your vaccination is also included as well. So um, this is the basic reproduction number uh, in this particular model. And then once you have the basic reproduction number, we're able to do some parameter estimation. So parameter estimation basically means just use a least squares uh, method to find the most optimal parameters or the most optimal parameters in a certain parameter range that fits best to your data. So you can see here that you can see we have uh, a parameter estimation where uh, it, it starts when you start, when you start a model, there is an artifact there, and with that, you it continues as well. So, of course, sometimes what people do is they probably will remove the first few points, uh, the first few points in the in the data, and then use a, a, and then do a, a model fix in that sense. Uh, however, we just decided to that we wanted this data to use. We don't we didn't want to make any adjustments to the mod, to the data. We try several parameters. And this was uh, the most optimal parameter that uh, we got for such a model. And then of course, for the parameter um, estimation, there are many techniques for estimating the uh, parameters in this sense. Uh, some of them are least squares, they also regularization methods that we also decided to test some of these methods to see if they actually give uh, better parameters as well. So once you do your parameter estimation, you get good, nice, you get appropriate parameters for your data sets that then you go back and use it to do your forecasting or simulation towards the future. So this is then what we do. We, we use a baseline, which is what the parameter estimates, uh, the parameters that we get from uh, the data. We use a baseline and then from there, we are able to change the parameters and see the effects the parameter has on the model. And this, we see the long-term simulations uh, uh, of these effects. So the blue line is the baseline. And then after we do the baseline, comparing to several parameter changes that we do, just to see what happens. So this particular one is for the infection class. Uh, what happens if we change some parameters in it? And then we also check here for the vaccination class, uh, what happens really if we change the parameters as well? Um, do we get the less population uh, being vaccinated and going into 
uh, infection or we get more being vaccinated. So this is really the dynamics of these kind of simulations. Then um, the next one was to think really about um, a model. So the next one is really to think really about um, the model again, because when we started, we said, okay, um, you could just take one, one vaccination and it's also okay. But thereafter we were told that, okay, if you took AstraZeneca, you need a, a double shot. So we thought, okay, we should develop a new model or an improved model where now we consider double vaccinations. So where you, you get one vaccination, of course, if you don't take the second one, then it means you are partially immune. But if you take the second one, then you would say we are, you are not, you are immune, you, are, you get your second shot or second booster of the vaccination. But uh, even in that case, we did not consider the fact that um, you can become reinfected again with the disease. So uh, we, we developed the models, the vaccination models continuously. So this is another, another step that we, we hope to do in the future. But the second step is just really to think that, okay, uh, what happens if we introduce a second vaccination shot? Just for the AstraZeneca case, of course, um, it's possible to also include the Johnson and Johnson cases as well. Uh, so here we have the, the susceptible class. We have um, the first dose, those who take the first dose, proportion of those who take first dose who go to take the second dose and so on. And we include that people, uh, people can die in each of these compartments. So this is how we also think, uh, thought of uh, developing this uh, model, in, in adding a second vaccination as well. And then, um, so for your double vaccination model now, uh, you have, of course, we have more compartments compared to the second one, uh, compared to the earlier one. So we have um, uh, more states equations to solve. So we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine states equations now that we need to solve. And of course, um, you, you need your initial conditions and then you need uh, parameters as well. So we do a basic reproduction number, again, the same technique. Uh, the basic reproduction number. Then you do a control production number where you introduce the efficacy of the vaccination as well. So again here, uh, we, we go again for our model to do parameter estimation in the same way as we did uh, earlier on. Uh, you do some um, least squares parameter estimation, best fits, or you can also try other regularization methods uh, and, and see which one gives you uh, good parameters, but these parameters are usually in certain range. So you, you can take them and you, you are able to get uh, something optimal for your simulation. So here again, we do another parameter estimation where we try to estimate uh, the data with our model and then derive optimal parameters. Once we get the optimal parameters, then we are able to do our simulations again uh, knowing that the optimal parameters are the baseline, we can do the simulations again uh, and we check again for, excuse me, for infection, for the infection class, as well as for the vaccinated class. But here for the vaccinated class, we decided to add the, the both, I mean, both first and second vaccination. Uh, it's quite interesting when I come to the discussions uh, in this sense. Okay. So it's it's a folklore. Uh, now even um, bachelor students, we are teaching bachelor students now even how to do this kind of uh, analysis, uh, parameter estimation and all that. And uh, we are also making sure that we make the codes as well freely available and we are going to share them online so that students can just start playing at, along with this kind of uh, thing. But the process is basically the same. Uh, you develop your model, with some parameters, you make an initial um, good guess for your parameters. You use the least squares method to compare or to derive the, the line of best fits that fits your, your data from your model. 
you fine tune these parameters and then you use uh, whatever you get as appropriate uh, parameters or optimal parameters to then do a forecasting of your of your model. Okay, so I'm not sure if I should answer the questions that were uh, 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 in the in the Q and A session, or I should move on. Just move on. When you finish, okay. we'll take them one after. All right. Okay. Okay. So now um, the, the next part, because once you start doing these parameter estimation techniques, um, you, you see in this case that they they look like they fit. They do not fit. Um, I mean, you have a parameter space, parameter estimate, uh, parameter space. Uh, sometimes uh, somebody chooses different parameters, they get almost the same um, error, error, error estimate because the least squares the method you are using. So we started thinking of how do we really determine um, appropriate parameters or exact or better parameters in using for our simulations. And this takes us to the data driven models. So for these data-driven models, uh, basically the, the main tool or main underlying um, knowledge that you need is a neural network. So um, your data is always, uh, your data does either your vaccinated data, your vaccination data, or your infection data. Uh, it's, uh, it's coming in, uh, in, in, a, in, a, in a certain sequence so that you have, and you can use this to develop um, an idea of neural network where you create these loss functions and then you create these loss functions and use them to learn uh, appropriate data set, appropriate uh, parameters for your model. So this is what this whole idea is about. So um, so this is what um, I call that we call the, or it's called the epidemiology informed neural network. So this is uh, coming from the physics informed neural network, which is uh, popularly called the PINS, uh, developed uh, by George Kanadiakis uh, at the Brown University with his uh, colleagues, uh, where they incorporate the, in this, in this, in this particular one, what we call epidemiology informed, we incorporate the epidemiological parameters in the model and initial values into the loss function as well. So the output from a um, epidemiology informed neural network will satisfy, uh, it, uh, satisfies the model that we would use. And if we achieve this by encoding the residuals of the model into the loss function. So the loss function in this case, so usually um, we have, if you have data, if you have data, so the loss function in this case means you include your the the not the the errors from your your MSC from your data and the model itself, including your initial conditions as well. So whatever data you want to consider, you can always uh, add this. If you have data, you can always add it uh, as part of your model and then create a loss function that inculcates your data and your model as well, and use this as a loss function. That will then give you the, the parameters. Okay, so in our case, we wanted to consider the uh, infection as well as the vaccination. Um, and we, wanted to, we also had the data, uh, the differential equation, the, the model that we, I just spoke about. Uh, the second one, the double vaccination. Now I'm considering the double vaccination in this case and then as well as your initial conditions. So um, the loss function is nothing else but the right-hand side minus the left-hand side. So if we go back, uh, maybe I go back briefly for you to see the model again. Uh, in this case, the loss function you develop is just uh, the, the left-hand side minus the right-hand side gives you the loss function, okay? So that's, a, that's a, the loss function for the differential equation. Okay, so you have it, depending on the number of states you have, you have an equal number of loss functions as well. And then once you have your loss function, you need to consider 
uh, what type of uh, optimizer you use for your training, your network, um, what, how are you going to use your data, what, what the data pre-processing here, we used a minimax scalar factor. Uh, we considered 80 neurons um, for each five hidden layers. Uh, we considered 80 neurons, and then we use also a Latin hypercube sampling that we use to impose the constraints. So we sample um, here. If you come here, so you have uh, some sampling space you need to consider. Sometimes you have less data. If you have less data, you need to uh, try to use uh, a method. Uh, here we use a cubic spline to interpolate the data to get more points. That will help us to, that helps us to use them for uh, our simulations. So basically this is the algorithm for the EINN. Um, it means take your input data, um, initialize your parameters, um, then your model as well, those of vaccination parameters, your initial values for your model as well. And then you compute, you construct your neural network, uh, you compute the residual, you calculate. So there are six steps, calculate the loss function, train the neural network again, and then you get your epidemiological parameters for your model in this case. So, um, so this, um, what we started, uh, we started to think of, um, so this is something also that as we saw, uh, one colleague of ours had already done, uh, informed us about it. Uh, so we did a recurrent neural networks, which we tried the first one. So recurrent neural networks are usually involved whenever you have sequential data, uh, you can always rely on recurrent neural networks. And we, here we tried three main um, networks uh, that you can see down here. We tried three main networks, the long short term memory. Uh, then we tried the bi-directional long short term memory. Okay, and then we also tried the gated recurrent units. Okay, so the long short term memory, you know that is also uh, an, an RNN where we have um, the input, the forget, and then the output as well. So these are all different types of architectures. So the, the LST is the one on the left, the bi-directional is one on the, in the middle, and then the gated recurrent units is one on the right. So you see that these are all, they are, they are all neural networks, but it's just, um, different architectures that gives us different uh, values as well. So we'll see in the end, well, how, how these uh, different uh, RNNs behave when we introduce the data as well. Okay. Then we also considered um, residual neural networks as well. Of course, this is a, a very popular one uh, where we know that uh, this one behaves more like an Euler equation, Euler's method. So, we also tried something that we say, okay, it's a bit more mathematical in this case. So a residual neural network means you put your inputs, you have your hidden layers, then you have an identity, and then you have an output as well. And one of the other main things that uh, you need to consider in this uh, kind of work is you need an error metric. Okay, so you, have, you must, must check Okay, how do I measure or how do I determine one one architecture is better than the other, or how one is one differs from the other, one algorithm is better than the other? How do we do it? So some of the metric error metrics, uh, usually the popular ones that are known is the root mean squared error. Okay, then we have the mean absolute percentage error, which is called a MIP. And then we also have the explained variance EV. And then of course the explained variance, it measures the variation in the predicted Y as explained by the neural uh, network algorithm. So we'll check, we'll compare these three error metrics as against the, all the different algorithms that we want to use. Okay. Then another aspect that we want to consider is what we call the k-fold validation. 
Uh, so the K-fold uh, K validation, or which is a cross validation, is we use it to determine how well our machine learning model can predict the outcome of unseen data. So this is uh, the K-fold uh, cross validation method. So it means that you, you take your data, you split them. Usually you try to split them into equal parts and then you use the first, you do a first iteration, you use as a test data, the rest as training data. Then you do a, another iteration. Now you use another portion of the data as a test data and the rest as uh, training data. And the idea is that, um, if you do the cross validation, which I said earlier, is uh, to determine how well your, your machine learning model can predict the outcome of unseen data. And we also, we also know one thing about the careful cross validation is that it works well for when you, do, when you do not have huge amounts of data, this is a good way to also um, uh, you, to, to predict or to use for your model as well. And it, it avoids bias, amount of biasness as well. And usually, uh, depending on how, how many times you split the data, uh, usually we call it K-fold because uh, you, we, did, we say we are splitting it into K. K um, uh, we, we do the data sample is split into K number of smaller samples. So that's how we come about that this name of K-fold cross validation uh, comes about. Uh, in our case, we did a fourfold cross validation. Uh, so the crossfold four validation means you split your data into four, into four parts, and then for first iteration, you take the first part and then you use it as your test set, and then you use the rest as training, and then you do this four times where you change uh, each each time each iteration. <clears throat> for each iteration, you change. Um, uh, the sets you use for your tests as the test sets, okay? So we use a four-fold validation. Of course, some people have, you can also do 10-fold cross-validation and so on and so forth. Um, so um, the idea uh, is uh, for us is uh, developing a, a whole, a, a deep learning forecasting workflow. Um, this means, that you want to create a system where you can have your COVID data, uh, you do all the pre-processing training, uh, you can change your models, uh, you can use any model you want, and then also try different types of architectures as well. So this is really what we are trying to develop or we are trying to build here as well. So that uh, I have shown maybe one, a single vaccination, a double vaccination, someone can also develop new vaccination methods, but we want to develop a whole workflow where anybody can change their, their, bring their own model. And then we go through this process and then we will be able to tell which architectures are good and which architectures are where perform better um, depending on the parameters that we set. Okay, so some uh, results. So here we use some, uh, some known ideas. Uh, of course, uh, what I didn't say or what I didn't mention is um, that um, <clears throat> a, a combination of the recurrent neural network and the residual neural network was a third part that we also did uh, consider as well. So, so um, we have the parameter settings for our, our networks, uh, for the algorithms. So we are for the LST, uh, for the RNNs, these are the parameters we consider, the parameter values we consider. And then for the R, uh, REST nets, these are the parameter values we also considered. And then for the cross validation method as well, we consider this uh, parameter setting. Okay, so um, first we, we tried uh, for the LSTM, that's the, <coughs> we tried for the LSTM, and then the long short term memories, we tried for the LSTM to see how well it could predict uh, the infected, um, infected uh, the data that we had, how well it could predict it. And then we also tested again for the by LSTM, how well it also could predict it as well. Uh, we didn't see much uh, difference actually. Um, and then 
We did this for the gated as well. And uh, we it's somehow it didn't give us uh, really uh, very, very good information at all with the, with the, with the gated um, network that we tried, we tried on. So we did for these, um, the LSTM, this is for the RNNs. We did for the LSTM, the bi LSTM and the GRU. And then uh, of course, we also did com uh, compare the ResNets, we combined the ResNets and LSTM and the ResNet and bi LSTM as well. And then we compared the, the errors from each of them, the errors for each of these groups, and then to able to tell which of the algorithms were expensed. So this is what I mean. And we, we saw that for the RST, uh, RMSE, if the RMSE is smaller, then we say, so we see that the, <coughs> so, for the um, for the RMSC and then for the MIP and then for the EV as well, we compare. For of course, uh, we see here the performance of each of these algorithms and the, in the error metric sense, in the error metric. And we see that the the ResNets actually give better performance uh, in all compared to the RNNs as well. And then we do some um, again further error metrics to to see. The, the graphics of these error metrics and to determine which algorithms learn better. Uh, so for the RMSE, as I said, if you have smaller values, it means better algorithm, uh, the better, uh, the better. And then for the EV, <clears throat> if you are closer to one, then you have a lower variation in the prediction. Then we also check for the cross, valid the cross validation scores. Uh, so we use the uh, uh, mean squares as well for the cross validation scores to come to check if we do for k fold uh, for four fold for five fold for six fold for seven fold if it does really make any difference uh, in the RNNs as well as for the ResNets if if depending on which uh, the fold you use we wanted to check if it really does make a difference in the average scores. Okay, so uh, in conclusion. Uh, in conclusion, um, I, pre I presented the COVID-19 vaccination, COVID vaccination model models and discussed briefly about the mathematical aspects of them, including the parameter estimation, and then spoke about the data-driven uh, vaccination models as well, where now we use um, neural networks um, to really um, learn these data and then to develop uh, an epidemiology informed neural network as well alongside. And then uh, one of the main challenges uh, during this period is really computing resources. Um, we, we have a huge challenge because, uh, you know, if you, if you have to run one of them, you, have, you, can, you have to take maybe two, three hours just waiting for uh, some picture to show. So for every small error, you, you have more work to do. So it's really a huge uh, challenge, uh, computing resources uh, for us. And of course, the other aspect is also data accessibility. Um, uh, for instance, if you check some of the data on vaccination in Ghana, you see that uh, the data is recorded. Maybe on some days there is no record, uh, several days no record, and then one day 10,000, and then for another several days, one week, no records, then you see 20,000. And so a lot of inconsistencies in this type of data as well. So towards the future, the plan is uh, really to now develop stochastic epidemiological models, which means uh, models that now inculcate the fights, uh, some amount of noise, and then analyze them as well and, and use them again now uh, in the sense of the data-driven uh, models as well, to see how how well they perform. If uh, we I add the idea that we we make the assumption that um, a lot of data from our part of the country uh, is not really, um, uh, as to say, clean data or nice data collected in uh, in in a systematic way. So this is actually one of the other other things we want to develop now or we are developing currently. 
And then finally, as I showed to you, um, I showed to you about the dashboard that we intend to develop or the workflow we are trying to develop as well. So uh, trying to develop a workflow where <clears throat> you, can, you can change your models and input new models in such a way that uh, you still get, sorry, you can, you can you, once we develop the architecture, you can, everybody can change a model, introduce their own models, their own data, and then use it to do some predictions as well, which is what we are currently working on. Okay, so thank you very much. And then if you have any questions, you can ask. All right, thank you very much, um, Dr. Moore, for your, for your well-detailed um, research and uh, good presentation. We thank you for the opportunity and we thank you for coming to share with us your work and uh, the good things you are doing in Ghana. So it's quite interesting to see that um, Dr. Moore, you know, talked about how they are using, you know, compartmental models or machine learning models to build um, to COVID-19, to build vaccination models and uh, data-driven vaccination models as well you know, with different um, tools and different algorithms from machine learning to deep learning to, you know, to the mathematics of it. This is quite uh, uh, interesting and, and very uh, good in our kind of field. And it's also interesting to also find out that things like this are, are happening in the global South in, in, in the places where, you know, access to data is not uh, so easy and we're able to come with uh, things like this. Thank you very much. Uh, now we will have to, you know, you know, take some questions uh, from the from the participant. I would like to call on the uh, person one that raised their hands. Uh, that is uh, <clears throat> this person is uh, open. Can I see the person again? Okay, uh, Rosaline Abba. Rosine Abba, if you are there, could you uh, speak up and uh, ask your questions? So we can start with you. Rosine Abba, you are muted. Are you there? Hello, Rosaline. Okay, uh, it seems like Rosalind is muted and uh, is no. not able to speak. Okay, we can hear you now. Go ahead. Yes, this is a wonderful presentation. Thank you so much. Yes, I just want to ask, add that I, the slides are beautiful, the models are beautiful. And I would like to really work with uh, Professor Stephen Moore for uh, some collaborative um, um, work on this. You know, uh, the usual thing is we do mathematical models, but doing it from the perspective of uh, neural networks, machine learning, and AI is, a, is an added, added advantage. I uh, would really love to uh, explore and uh, do some work with him, if he doesn't mind. But I want to ask if um, the uh, education or um, campaign aspect or enlightenment aspect of uh, uh, AI in the, is, is, is included in this model. Ah, okay. Um, you mean the education aspect of AI? As, as a, yes, a parameter, a parameter. Well, what do you mean by education aspects? No, I'm talking about, you know, when you create models, you, you, you have some variables and parameters. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so I wanted to know if in your parameter estimation or in your, param in your model formulation development, if there's a parameter. Ah, for education. Or education or enlightenment. Ah, no, 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 no. 
no, okay. no, no, no. There's okay. no Okay, I want to suggest if it's possible, can it be included? AI. Um, yeah, of course. I mean, it's, it's a model. So far as you can develop um, your state equations, that's your, 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 your model. You can, so far as you, you have a model, you can always play alongside and do whatever you want to do. So okay. here we consider this, uh, you, maybe you want to add education or some other form, but these are usually, I don't know, maybe you can add them as control variables or some other type of variables, uh, but I, I think Not that- a parameter. Oh, a parameter. So I think that is possible. Yes. Yeah, yeah, it's possible. Yes. It's very yes. possible. As a control. I mean, it's very possible. It, it shouldn't be okay. a problem. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much, bro. You're welcome. All right. Thank you very much, um, Rosalind uh, Abba, for your question. And uh, I'll go to uh, Dr. Geta Chiu Tilahun uh, for your question. Uh, if you're there, Dr. Uh, Geta Chiu, could you please ask your question? The mic okay. is yours now. Thank you very much. Really, I appreciate the presenter. The way he uh, presents is very attractive. The slide is also very attractive. Uh, everything is clear. But I want to ask uh, two questions. You see, uh, the main targets of developing uh, this infectious uh, disease model is to indicate or to show the dynamics of the disease and uh, uh, also to indicate the controlling mechanism. So if it is that, uh, I want to ask uh, the first thing when you develop the model, uh, especially the compartmental model, the vaccination model, uh, uh, there is a dynamics, there is a prediction mechanism. Then after, uh, there is a deep data-driven uh, neural network model. So when we compare the two models in terms of controlling uh, this disease, which one is the best? This is my question. Okay. Uh, the second question might be, uh, uh, the presenter informed us or showed us uh, in the future, he's going to consider stochastic uh, differential equations. So what is the reason that he chose stochastic differential equations? So, or because sometimes it is depend on the number of uh, data or the, uh, the, the population he's going to consider for small population, as well as for the large population. For large population like data, uh, I mean in Ghana, considering a stochastic differential equation is Good. Uh, that's my question. Okay. Thank you. So yeah. So your your question is: Can we compare um, the methods uh, from the best parameter, the parameter estimation methods, right, with the neural network methods? So um, as I presented earlier on, um, <clears throat> so usually here we do the parameter estimation of this. Right, and then we we use it to then do um, the forecasting, right? So the idea is that uh, for the neural network, the idea is that if you have, so this is uh, for instance, just using the um, the RNNs, the idea is that it, it should be able to give you. So you can see if you look at this data, this particular one, right? You look at the, the yeah. prediction, and then you look at the data itself. You can see it's almost 100% accurate. It follows exactly the data, apart from getting to the end and then part, which in comparison to something like the least squares method, you see here that you it is it doesn't really follow in that in that trend as well. So it follows a bit, but not so much. And that's actually the main uh, difference between these two methods. Of course, um, we do not say, or I do not say that um, the RNNs or the ResNets are better. Uh, we hope to develop more architectures as well, uh, transfer learning or transformers. Uh, we are trying, we are trying other, other types of architectures uh, just to see the differences uh, between the different architectures on, on the same data sets, what happens. 
And then um, the other aspect of the stochastic, uh, you do, doing the same thing for the stochastic is because um, usually what happens is, um, as I explained, we have, we in Ghana, for instance, if you look at the data from Ghana, uh, although it's supposed to be maybe from March or somewhere 2022, you see, or 2021, you see that you do not get daily data, daily records, or even weekly records, you do not get. Yeah. It's not very, very, it doesn't follow systematically. So maybe in a certain week, uh, in the first week, you get um, 10,000 recorded on Friday. Then the next week, there is nothing recorded. So everything is zero. Then in two weeks later, it is um, 15,000 is recorded. So th this doesn't, this doesn't. Yeah, yeah, you... I'm hearing, I'm hearing. Exactly. So this doesn't give you really a good um, idea of the flow of the data itself. And then one of the ideas is, okay, let's assume uh. that the data has this inherent um, noise. Can we still use the neural network to find and predict this idea of um, the behavior and the long-term prediction as well. So that's, that's actually the main idea behind it. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you very much. You're welcome. Might be, can I add one, one elaboration? Yes. If someone asked me the advantage of uh, this uh, neural network uh, modeling over that of compartmental modeling, what yeah. can I say in a short word, the advantage over it? The advantage over it is your neural networks, they learn the data itself. So they become better for forecasting. They, 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 you give them okay. the data, you give them the model, they learn the whole data, and then they, they perform better in forecasting the future, uh, in, in the future forecasting, which is uh, compared to the compartmental models where uh, you have the you have to do a parameter estimation, and this parameter estimation gives yeah. you parameters within certain range. So one person can take different set of parameters, another person can take different set of parameters, and they will all they are all supposed to be in the same error range. So the simulation is fine, but this is different from the neural network. Thank you very much. Well, all right. Thank you, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Uh, Getachu, for your question. Um, before I go to the <coughs> Q&A uh, chat, we have a lot of questions, but I would like to take another question from uh, uh, one person that raised their hands, just a moment. Um, we had one person that raised their hand. Okay, is it two now? Okay, it's two now. Um, Isabella Mbai. After Isabella Mbai, I will have to go to the chat to see the questions that people sent in. Isabella Mbai, please, you are permitted to talk right now. Could you um, um, unmute yourself if you are there? Isabella? Okay, it seems like uh, Isabella is not available. Uh, we can go to Chibweze Igbo. Chibweze Igbo, if you are there, you could just ask your question. Good evening, Doc. Uh, yes. Good evening to the presenter and everyone in the house. Uh, it, it very well presented um, um, work. Um, I know the neural network and every other algorithm have their strengths and weaknesses when it comes to either learning a system and then predicting them. And um, I believe all of us have been encouraged to look for algorithms that could give us um, faster solutions and accurate at the same time, depending on the size of resources that is available at our disposal. So I'm thinking that is one of the reasons why we go for different types of algorithms to know which one suits our situation better. But I wanted to ask the doc that presented, uh, I believe one of the reasons why we solve these problems is to advise sometimes and then make policies for our governments. 
from the simulations you've done so far, I know there is so much to be done yet. What could you tell uh, Ghana government? Because I, 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 I have just done my PhD from Ken Westy. Um, mm. Some of these challenges are there. From the data you have gotten, yeah. the simulations you have done, what informed policies do you think we can get out of this? Practical informed poli uh, policies. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, thank you very much, um, Chibuzi. Um, so, you know, when COVID started, as I said, this was the initial, these are initial models. So when COVID started, the idea of uh, reinfection after vaccination was not even there. Then we, it came that, okay, if you took the AstraZeneca shot, uh, vaccine, then you needed a second shot. So, Suddenly, people who took the first shot and felt they were immune, some started getting the diseases again, COVID again, and they said, no, you actually needed a second shot. And then even that did not still make you um, Im absolutely immune from it. You still will get it, but the symptoms are not that severe again. So it, it became like uh, information that was happening almost every week or every month, changing the in new information was coming in. So we started building this with the idea that, okay, so for instance, if you check the second model, where I said we did a double vaccination model, if you check this vaccination model, for instance, you see that we do not add the fact that the person can get reinfected, okay? And so this already does not, so this is why, uh, although we have this, we've not published it yet because uh, once we started doing it, things started changing and we, we felt, okay, if you publish it, it doesn't make sense. Uh, best to wait. Uh, now that COVID is going on, we know exactly how to develop a model that can be helped to use for policy making. But the idea is that if, for instance, we assume that there was no reinfection then we could easily ad advise on what to do, uh, uh, what, how to increase the, uh, the vaccination rates. You could advise if government increases, uh, maybe if instead of uh, vaccinating 1,000 people per, in every, every week, it can increase to 2,000, maybe the disease will go down faster or people will, be, people will get well better. But, these are things that um, as, we go, as we go on, we try to develop and build on in a way that hopefully once we get a very, very, now that we know the nature of COVID uh, somehow, I'll say quasi know the nature of COVID, it's possible to now develop a model that we're going to be used as um, a policy making and to advise government on what to do and what not to do in these cases, but of course, uh, in other future cases as well, it is possible to then now use these ideas to improve and guide government, uh, government policy. Okay, thank you very much uh, for your feedback. And um, we uh, were noted, I would like to go to the chat now to you know, read out some questions and uh, we'll take it up from there. So this question is coming from Josephine Tete. He says, which parameters from the model were estimated? So I'm gonna ah. take two, I'm gonna okay. take two questions. Uh, you, can you can take them at, at the same time because uh, we'll have quite okay. a lot of them. Here. And since we still have time, uh, we can just uh, use it and you know, have a proper debate on this. Uh, work today so um um so that question is taken which is uh, which parameter from the model were estimated then another question is coming from lauren suyama, suye, suyama and it says uh how do you choose the best optimal parameter between using a regularization technique or the linear list li linear list square if I'm, if I'm is it liner? Okay, liner list square. That's what that's what the linear is linear is linear. So, uh, yeah, that, that, that's what that's what I, I I know. But the the person wrote liner, but it's fine. So we have two questions for you, sir. So one is which parameters uh, from the model were estimated? That is from Josephine, and the one from Lorraine is uh, how do you choose the best optimal parameter between 
using a regularization technique or the linear least square? I think but the, the two questions somehow are related. So you can go ahead. Yeah, I mean, they, they are both related. So um, of course, um, in in our model, the which parameters are estimated, it's more of some of the, if you, so for instance, if you look at this model, some of the parameters you can estimate, some you, some you some you can fit you can do your least squares to get them others you need to estimate them so estimation some of them means uh, you can you can estimate how many um, the life expectancy of people right how many people are dying or you can estimate as well um, the number of people coming into the country or into the system this also is data that you can also get so these are ones that you can actually calculate. By estimates, I mean calculate. And then the ones that we did not know um, where we wanted to really um, get them in a way that they fit the model are the ones that we put in as um, uh, unknown or the one, the parameters we are looking for or the searching parameters, I will say. So in that one, we almost all the parameters uh, we we have we did uh, we did try to do put them in the search space to be able to derive them. So most of the parameters you see, uh, we really didn't um, we didn't calculate them. We really did a, a data fit to get these parameters. And then the second one was um, how to choose the best optimal comparing the regularization methods. So um, this is a whole topic on its own. Regularization methods uh, means that uh, you are adding some penalization of the data as well to, to your least squares method. And for you need to choose the right parameter or uh, the right penalty parameter for your regularization technique to be able to get the appropriate um, results. So you need to, it's, it's a play on, on uh, it's a it's kind of a heuristics idea that you should check if you want a certain error bound, of course, uh, for most models, there are ways of choosing the right parameter or the right penalty parameter to be sure that you are within a certain error bound. But it's still a play of heuristics for us that we try different penalty parameters just to get better uh, outputs. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Moore. I will, at this time, we'll take another uh, two questions possibly from uh, we'll take uh, if we we'll take like six questions here then we'll go to ask uh, for people that raise their hands to speak so two questions uh, one coming from lingali lingali uh, lamini he said thank you dr mo has your team considered to look at uh, post times post time effect like long term COVID on uh, individuals that had COVID, that had COVID and were vaccinated on your model. So um, post time. Then okay. another question is uh, Michael is coming from Michael Zimba, and he says, "Could Doc please elaborate on the compute compute uh, power?" So I believe he's talking about computation power setup used yeah. in the training. So in the issue of uh, computation in terms of your GPU, your CPU proportion. I mean, because you talked about the process speed and all that. So, so two questions right now. Over to you, sir. Yeah. So, um, yeah, we we have not considered the post term effects as a long term COVID uh, on individuals. Uh, we've not yet considered that, but of course, uh, we are open for this kind of discussions as well towards the future uh, of it as well. And I feel this is why this. Um, why weekly seminars are there uh, to look for people who, are, who have other ideas to also come and test them against what we have developed, uh, what we are developing as well. And uh, the computing power, uh, so if you can see, uh, one of the things I, I posted here uh, in the end, uh, towards the end was, um, so, Towards the end was on our challenge with uh, with the compute with the compute power as well. Uh, this is the setup that we use. 
Uh, this, we run it basically on a simple CPU. Uh, it takes several hours uh, to do it. And that's, that's, that's actually the, the difficulty that we had. Because we didn't do, we didn't do a lot of um, layers. Uh, we, we tried to reduce as much as possible to enable us to get uh, the results that we are looking for. So um, I wrote the, the information that we hear that we used. Uh, so here, for instance, we used, um, here we did use, we created five hidden layers and each of these hidden layers had 80 neurons. And for us, this is what we used to do this kind of simulation. And it actually took, um, many hours. Uh, this, uh, I have the information, but I didn't really report. I didn't add them yet, but I can add them and then I, I can share them with you. So uh, everything, we, we didn't use any GPUs, by the way, no GPUs. Um, of, of course, it's one of the reasons I wrote in the end about computing uh, resources, right? So it's one of the main difficulties uh, for us. Uh, computing resources is uh, important. So I'm hoping, uh, I mean, I was fortunate enough uh, recently to have gotten some Google compute space for some few months. And this, we hope to use it to accelerate some of the things that we are doing to compute some of the things, architectures, and maybe even add more hidden layers as well. Okay, thank you very much. I think um, you're right in that because I was also going to tell you, you know, recommend the Google, Google Collab if you're yeah. using Py. Google Collab actually gives uh, some computing GPU. power and yeah. Uh, yeah, some GPU space for you to be able to run things like this. Yeah. Uh, I think if you if you're not using a paid one, it might be it might have some limitations. But if you're oh, using yeah. a paid app, so, so, that's, that's what I said. Um, uh, it's, it's a challenge for us uh, because we are not using a paid one. So we need to always restrict ourselves to um, how we can use uh, the free accessibilities that we have. Uh, it would be nice if we, we have enough money to buy compute space and then to test a lot more of the things that we are doing here. This is uh, this for us, is, uh, it will be a bottleneck for, for the work that we're doing here. All right, thank you very much. I will take two more questions from um, the chat with, and then we'll, we'll look for people that want to speak. So uh, this question is coming from, um, um, just a moment. So I see Kirsten, Kirsten Noshia, he says, with regards to the K-food K-food validation, you said it's, it's used, uh, for small data, what amount of data is small data, please? So he's trying to find out what amount of data is small. And uh, the second question is coming from Josephine Teta again. He said, could you please briefly uh, talk about the guiding principles for the selection of uh, the parameters used in the neural networks? Uh, okay, this question could, uh, could actually be, you know, you could, some of these questions that are, that are, that are like this could actually be, you know, gotten by sending you an email. Meanwhile, um, Dr. Moore's email address will be on the on the website, and we're still going to post the video, the talk on the website, so you can actually assess it after now. In case we don't answer your questions, or if you want to chat or write uh, Dr. Moore uh, privately, you can do that uh, through his email address, which uh, is still going to be shared. Dr. Moore, you could also share your email address. On the chat yeah it's here so on the slide on the on the last slide here okay. if it is so, there you um, can see my email address okay so would you be kind to answer the two questions which one the one that talks about the k-food validation and uh, uh the guiding principles for the selection of the parameters okay uh, so uh the k-food validation also uh, is usually used for small data sets um, and honestly, the data set we are using is not a lot. If, you, if I show you the data set, you can see it's from 2020 March to 2022 um, September. And it's not even a daily data set. Uh, sometimes it's weekly data set. 
uh, bi-weekly data sets. So it's really uh, not much. And so uh, you must just look at what you are doing. And But personally, I think if you have data sets of maybe more than um, 500 data points, uh, or maybe, yeah, if you have like 500 data points, this is good data sets. Uh, maybe this is not small anymore. But for anything less than 500, maybe 300, 200, must be able to think about it a bit more as a smaller data set and you and work differently. Okay. Uh, I and, then the, about yeah. and then the guiding principles for the parameter selection. Uh, so um, what, what we did was, um, I'm not sure if this is for which one. Okay, the question uh, is, the this is the guiding principles for the neural network. Yes. Yeah, so. The parameters for use it for the neural network. Yeah, I mean, we, we just, for, so for, because we have data for infection and we have data for vaccination, uh, we try to use uh, these ones as uh, the main uh, parts. So even in, a, even in also concerning the model development, this is the aspect that we really focused on because once we have data for these ones, we can, we can fine tune the parameters that will fit this aspect of our data and use the rest for the model as well. All right, thank you very much. Uh, this question is coming from Jim Jacks. Uh, Jim Jack said, um, is asking if I can please add to this question, how does the stochastic approach impact the uh, data availability challenge. It's asking how the stochastic approach impact. Uh, so maybe as you say, we've not done stochastic work. I said, okay. this is a future, future okay. work. As I put here, I put here future works, right? So we have okay. not done anything on stochastic so far. Uh, so we cannot, we cannot tell. Tell. All right. All right. Thank you very much. So Isabella Mbai also said that can this model be applied to, to a longitudinal study? Um, it says from Dr. Annie Wawiri Kabina, Kenya. So can this model be uh, applied to a longitudinal study? Uh, what, what does it mean, longitudinal study? Um, Sorry, um, Isabella actually has their hand up. We can, maybe they can expand on their question. I'll just let them Yeah, I, I tried to call, 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 the, call Isabella before, but it wasn't talking. Thank you. Uh, Thank you so are you there? Okay, go ahead. Thank you so much. <clears throat> I will speak on her behalf. Okay. I'm Dr. Anne Obire from Kenya. Uh, okay. I'm done who asked the question. And I was wondering from the presentation, it looks like, it's a cross-sectional study, mathematical study you've done, but I was wondering if one had to do a longitudinal study that would take a long time, a study that would take like three years or so, is it possible to apply the same model? Yeah, I mean, it, it's just a matter of if you know, it, it, it's only your data. You need data yes. and then you need your mathematical model. So that is why I said, we, once we have, once we create a workflow, even if, as your data increases and you get more and more data, you can just put it in and keep working on and on and on. And I think once you keep doing that, it will keep um, improving and giving you better results. So it, it really doesn't matter. Once you have the workflow, it's just a matter of new data or more data. The more data you have, um, the better it will be. So that's the, that's the main idea. Thank you so much. Otherwise, a good presentation. Thank you. Welcome. All right. Thank you very much. Um, uh, thank you for your question. And uh, we'll go to the next one. Uh, it says uh, from Mahmoud Ibrahim. It says, uh, which method did you use to arrive at the best, at the basic reproduction number? Uh, could you extend your model to an optimal control problem? Um, so, I mean, the, the basic idea of uh, deriving the, the basic reproduction number is the, 
the next generation metrics that you can always use uh, to derive it. Uh, and then, yes, you can extend the, to optimal control models, uh, but you have to, it's not that straightforward. You have to think a bit more. Uh, you have to do more, some a bit of uh, work as well, but it's very straight. It's also possible. There's no way about it. It's possible. They already works. The, I've seen works that people have done using optimal control for this. So it's really possible. Okay, thank you. Um, the two last questions here is from uh, Samuel Darcy and Richard Muntali. So uh, Samuel says, uh, thank you, doc Dr. Moore, for the beautiful presentation. Um, as your undergraduate student, this webinar will assist me going forward. Okay, this is not a question. Um, Richard says, um, Google do have uh, academic proposed program which might help on that. Okay, this is also not a question. This is, I think this is talking about the Google the Collab. Space. Yes. Yeah. And he also shared the link. Uh, you could actually, yeah. you know, get this link to be able to use it. Yeah, okay. thank you very much, Richard. I've already opened it and I think it's fine. I'll go through it. Hopefully apply for it as well. Okay, so this last one says, could you extend the model of, uh, to an optimal control problem? This uh, I think I, I said it already. I said yes, uh, it's possible. Okay, okay. All right. I think uh, that is all. We've answered almost all the questions, I guess. Yes, we've answered all the questions. And this is interesting. Thank you very much, Dr. Mo, for your time. And thank you for you know, bringing up all these uh, uh, issues and uh, we're able, you're able to answer all the questions that people asked and given uh, the direction to follow and uh, for such kind of research in Africa. Thank you and we appreciate you. Thank you very much for coming to share your knowledge with us. Um, uh, Dr. Kong, Professor Kong, are you there? So that you can say something before we go. Um, I'd like to introduce our director, Dr. Kong, Jude Kong, to say something if it's available. Okay, it seems like uh, maybe it's not available at the moment. So on behalf of Dr. Kong and um, all of us from the AI for PEP Network uh, lecture series, the organizers, the Cypher group, we want to thank you for coming today. And want to assure you that uh, this will continue. We have our, our, our lecture series uh, in the next uh, two weeks as usual. And um, the link for this uh, presentation today is gonna be on the website. You can go there have a look or watch it or download it. Uh, Dr. Moore's email address is still on, on, the, on, the, on the slides, on the, on the last page of the slide, if you want to write or contact him directly. You can also write us at uh, AI for PEP Network or um, Cypher, all our website, or go to our website to get the um, email addresses to write. Also follow us on our social media handles. Thank you very much. And at this time, we would like to close the webinar for today. I'll see you next two weeks. All right. Thank you. Bye-bye.